Retro Days. Like malls, department stores were a common destination for kids in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And while there was always something interesting to look at or do in those department stores, I won't claim they held a candle to the variety of a mall or the pure unadulterated joy of a toy store. Still, even if we were dragged there by our parents who were intent on buying new slacks or yet another kitchen appliance, our wide eyes would no doubt scope out something better and before they knew it, our parents would be wandering around the vast aisles calling our names. Let's see if they can still find us in the defunct department stores of yesteryear. To understand the rise in popularity of department stores in the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century, one must look no further than the Industrial Revolution, which kicked off in 1765 when Scottish inventor James Watt created the steam engine. Roughly three decades later, Samuel Slater designed Slater Mills in Pawtucket, which quickly became a successful textile mill. Building off these new, efficient manufacturing processes of the 18th century, further innovation in the same area paved the way for various affordable items that were easily manufactured and of high quality. The very first department store was Bon Marqué, founded by Aristide Bosecat in Paris in 1838, though it took until the 1850s to evolve into a store that sold a variety of items in different departments. In contrast, Delaney's New Mart, which opened in 1853 in Dublin, Ireland, was built to be a department store. Other early examples include the Marble Palace, Macy's, Marshall Field & Company, and Wanamaker's. Over time, general stores became department stores as towns grew into cities, and by 1890, the landscape of retail had changed. The rise of department stores called for new buildings that catered to their large size and open layouts. These architectural innovations allowed for additions to the shopping experience rarely seen at the time, like reading rooms, restaurants, restrooms, wrapping services, and elaborate displays. From the 50s through the 80s, discount department stores, places we'd contemporarily call big box stores like Kmart were more popular than the average supermarket. Not every department store survives though, and what follows are a few of those failures. Why settle for some of it when you can get all of it? Get it all, get it all, get to Zare and get it all. It's gotta be a knockout, so I got to Zare. It's gotta last. It's gotta have a name I know. So we got to Zare. Get it all. It's gotta be a real value. Get to sale and get it all. Exciting fashions, famous brands, honest quality, genuine value. Get to sale and get it all. The first defunct department store on today's list is Zaire, which actually began its life as the New England Trading Company in 1919. Brothers Max and Morris Feldberg sold hosiery and underwear as a wholesaler to department stores before opening their own retail location in 1929 under the name Bell Hosiery Shops and then later simply Bell Shops. They continued to expand through the 1930s and 40s, even buying out competitor Nugent's. In the 1950s, as discount stores were on the rise, the Feldbergs realized they had to make drastic changes to how they did business and opened their first Zare in 1956 alongside a stop and shop supermarket. Zare continued with restrained growth until the 60s when they began a program to open a Zare store in as many major markets as they could. Things were looking up until the mid 70s when stiff competition in the discount store market led to steeply declining profits. In something of a twist, Zare's chairman, Summer Feldberg, and his cousin, Stanley Feldberg, opened a new store meant to compete with Marshalls. This department store was called TJ Maxx. In 1978, the Feldbergs reached outside the family for the first time in the company's existence for help and handed over daily control to Maurice Segal. Although there was an effort to save Zare, over the next decade, all their profit came from their other holdings, TJ Maxx, BJ's Wholesale Club, and Hit or Miss. And in yet another twist, in 1988, Zare, now mostly operating as the new subsidiary company TJX Companies Inc., 
sold their remaining 400 Zayer locations to none other than Ames. Zayer may have been no more, but the founding company lived on as the American multinational off-price department store corporation, TJX, which is more than we can say for the company that bought them out. According to legend, little folks know, Hills is where the toys are. Hills Toy Layaway, just 10% down, a small service charge, lays away toys, little and large. Hundreds of toys, express layaway too, so layaway is even easier for you. Remember, Hills Toy Layaway. One reason they're different and why they say, Hills is where the toys are. At low prices, every day. Before we can talk about Ames, however, we have to discuss Hills, because they suffered a similar fate as Zare. Also, like Zare, Hills started as a hosiery business run by founder Herbert Goldberger, which eventually morphed into a chain of discount stores, the first of which opened in 1957. Herbert grew the chain to 99 stores before transferring power to his son, Stephen Goldberger, in 1981. Hills continued to grow through the mid-80s, but eventually fell victim to an enormous $900 million debt and increased competition from Kmart and Walmart. Although the company recovered from their 1991 bankruptcy under the leadership of Michael Bozick, the struggle for power within the company led to a number of leadership positions changing hands. In 1998, Ames once again swooped in and bought out the remaining 155 stores. Despite its rocky history, many associate a particular sentimentality with Hills. A specific department Hills was known for, and one kids of the time would certainly have latched onto as a happy memory, was the toy department. Seemingly endless aisles of action figures, play sets, games, and more would call to young shoppers, dragging them from their parents' side to ogle the vast array of plastic wonder. Another indelible memory is that of the store's busy snack lobby where visitors could hang out at a table and munch on popcorn, pretzels, and hot dogs while washing it down with a soda or icy. In fact, the intermingling aromas of these foods was so specific and nostalgic, Pittsburgh Dad of YouTube fame partnered with Sugar Creek Candle Company to create a Hills Snack Bar Candle, which are still available and described as having the rich aroma of slushies, popcorn, and soft pretzels. It's coming to every Ames discount department store to make sure these advertised sale prices are as low as you'll find anywhere. Save $4 on men's Lee stone washed and black denim jeans, now just $18.99. Or save $5 on men's Lee pleated and acid washed jeans, just $24.99. These prices are backed by something so reliable, we guarantee it will never be broken. It's the Ames low price promise. Ames, we grew up with better values. That brings us finally to the eater of dying department stores, Ames. Three brothers, Irving, Herbert, and Milton Gilman, started the company in 1958 in a building previously occupied by the Ames Warstead Textile Company Mill. The Gilman strategy was to focus on the less competitive rural market and offer a wide variety of discount items which these smaller communities would otherwise have no access. Paired with strong growth and aggressively building new stores, Ames was largely successful into and through the 1980s. However, prior to this, the company had already grown teeth and hungered for the flesh of its own kind. Ames' cannibalistic rampage started with the Joseph Levitt Corporation and the K&R Warehouse Corporation in 1972, but eventually Ames devoured the Davis Wholesale Company, quickly followed by the 32-store Big N chain from Neisner Brothers. The feeding frenzy continued in 84 with King's Department Stores, in 85 with G.C. Murphy Company, and finally the Zare chain in 1988. This constant consumption of dead department store flesh, or, you know, maybe extending credit to any consumer who wanted it, led to bankruptcy. And when they emerged in 1992, they did so with a renewed hunger. In that way, Ames stores began opening from the carcasses of Bradley's, James Way, Caldor, Montgomery Ward, and, of course, Hills. 
When speaking to people about their memories of Ames, many only remember these last dying days of the company in the late 90s and early 2000s when walking into Ames was akin to entering a dead mall. Shelves would be sparsely and often erratically stocked, and the large store would be manned by a zombified staff of two or three teens that had no interest in helping you locate products. Water-stained ceilings, dirty bathrooms, and old stock were the norm. Now, perhaps I'm exaggerating just a mite, or perhaps not. For like a zombie itself, there were rumors in 2022 that Ames would emerge from the grave in the spring of 2023. Of course, no such resurrection has occurred as of this recording, and the original announcement, which had appeared on Ames' website, has been removed. Of course, as with any business, department stores will come and go. Some other defunct stores have been mentioned in passing, such as Montgomery Ward and Bradley's, and there were others still unmentioned in this video, like Bonwit Teller, Woolworth's, Pomida, and Gimbel's. One defunct store I have a personal connection to was TG&Y, which to be fair was more of a five and dime or variety store than an official department store, though they did have departments, so I'm gonna talk about it. TG&Y was at its best in the late 60s, and at its peak had upwards of a thousand stores in 29 states. By the mid-80s, TG&Y was acquired by competitor McCrory Stores, which itself would file for bankruptcy in 2001. When I was a kid, our family would affectionately call TG&Y Turtles, Girdles, and Yo-Yos, accompanied by the inevitable cackle of laughter. The closest comparison is probably the modern Dollar General in terms of offerings, but with more of a Walgreens vibe. I can vividly remember my parents letting me purchase a plastic paratrooper action figure and innumerable goldfish from TG&Y, and I was sad when our neighborhood store shuttered its doors. The cyclical nature of birth, death, and rebirth often occurs in business. Mom and pop shops are overtaken by department stores, which are overtaken by malls, which are overtaken by internet retail. What new form of consumerism will devour that last one is anybody's guess, but this isn't about the future, it's about the past. So I have to know, which were your favorite department stores? What are some of your best memories connected to them? I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. And if you enjoy our content, please consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and maybe even activating that ubiquitous notification bell. It really does make a huge difference. Let's meet again next week to celebrate yesteryear right here on Retro Days. Clicky, clicky.